My name is Hillary and welcome to Family Church Online. If this is your first time watching, welcome. Our hope for you is that you're encouraged by this online experience. We'd love to connect with you and know that you're here. You can just click the pop-up link to let us know. Our weekend gatherings and community has looked different during this season, but Family Church has never closed. Through your engagement and generosity, we're still moving forward together and making a difference in people's lives through Family Church Kids with a weekly online experience, at-home craft ideas and resources for parents, youth connections for 6th through 12th grade students, community groups online for people to continue to connect with one another throughout the week as well as our food distribution to those who are in need in our communities. But most importantly, we're still bringing the life-changing message of Jesus to thousands of people. None of this would be possible without the incredible faithfulness and generosity of those who've continued to step out in faith and worship God in their giving. Generosity is our privilege, and we give thankfully because everything that we have is a gift from God, and He deserves our first and our best. You can be a part in making a difference by giving today. If this might be your first time giving back through Family Church, I'd like to invite you to ask God to speak to you right now. The easiest way to give is to text the word FC Whittier or FC Signal Hill, and then the amount to the number 28950, and just follow the prompts. Or you can go to familychurch.co to check out other ways to give, like set up a reoccurring gift, or even sending a check through the mail. Let's pray together. Dear Jesus, thank you for this opportunity to be generous with what you've trusted us with. We praise you for your provision, and we ask that you would continue to bless each and every giver as they put you first in their finances. Thank you, God, for this opportunity to be used by you to make a difference. It's an honor. We love you, and in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thank you for your faithful sacrifice as you continue to worship God in your giving. Now let's lean in and engage in a song from our team and a message from our Signal Hill campus pastor, Matt Ansel. Searching, your love was never far. You made a way to get to me, you were the whisper leading me to your heart. Forever I belong to you. Now I can see clearly, my God, you are for me. You won't let go, your love won't let me down. And I know it's true. In 
and I know it's true Yeah, I know that your love is all around I believe in you, holding on to you Holding on and I know you will never fail I want all of you, you never change your love won't let me down Love won't let me I want all of you, you never change your love won't let me down Love won't let me
Family Church Online. So glad you've joined us wherever you're watching. I hope this message encourages you today and helps you grow in your faith. Even if you're just curious about the things of God, I think this message is going to be great for you. My name is Matt Ansel. I'm one of the pastors here at Family Church, and it's a joy to bring you this message this morning. We're going to be in God's Word, and uh, we're in a series called Fact Check, and uh, it's kind of what we're doing during as we approach this 2020 presidential election. It's approaching. We're fact checking everything to make sure that whatever the candidates are saying is true or not true. It's something we do with our husbands and our wives um, or our friends every time they make a statement and we're not sure if we believe them. So what do we do? We type it in Google to see if it's true or not. And that's usually how my dates go with my wife, Hillary. We're constantly looking across the table and saying to each other, mm, let me look that up real quick. <laughs> and so in this message series, our goal as a church is to address some of the common beliefs and some of the common sayings that people say in our culture that people live by, but maybe they aren't necessarily true. So let's see what God has to say about the things, about some of these things as we open up the Bible and focus on one of the very dangerous lies that are out there that many, many people live their lives on. And here is the lie. And this is the title of my message. And this is what we're going to be talking about. It doesn't matter how you live as long as you don't hurt anyone. Have you ever heard someone say that? Maybe you've said it yourself. It doesn't matter how you live as long as you're not hurting anyone. If you're sitting next to someone, there are some people in this room while we're filming this right now. Um, just take it. Maybe you're at home and you're sitting next to someone. But take a glance at the person next to you. And on the count of three, I just want you to point to the one that looks like they are the biggest sinner. Are you ready? One, two, three, go. <laughs> there are a lot of fingers pointed at me right now. Um, there's one guy at home pointing at himself since he's all alone. And that's really good. At least, he's, at least you're a truthful sinner. And I like that about you. <laughs> you know, it's kind of awkward just to point at someone and say you're the biggest sinner because in reality, there's something the Bible calls an unpardonable sin. In culture today, people could argue that the unpardonable cultural sin is to call someone a sinner. You can't call someone a sinner in our world today. It's totally unacceptable to say what anyone else does is a sin. And you'll hear it all the time. Maybe you've even said it or you believe this. And that is this idea that it doesn't matter how you live as long as you don't hurt anyone. But the truth is God never said that. Hillary and I had a great opportunity to go to Israel in January of this year. And we had an incredible tour guide. He was this older man who volunteered his time every single day to take groups of people all across the land of Israel and share the culture and the history of Israel. And he was a phenomenal historian. I mean, you ask him any question, he knew the answer. And of course, we went to all the biblical spots and walked where Jesus walked and where he performed miracles. It was a powerful time. And we were in a boat on the Sea of Galilee where Jesus walked on water. It was so cool. Then there was one day as we got to know this tour guide over the week that someone got up the guts to ask him uh, something about what he actually believed about all of this. He's sharing these stories about Jesus and all the things and all these things and all, taking us to all these sites. And I was shocked to hear him make this statement. He said, I am of the belief to live and let live. I'm sure you've heard this phrase before. Basically, he was saying, I'm going to live my life and let other people live theirs. And who am I to tell someone how to live their life or what to believe? Don't tell me how to live my life and I won't tell you how to live yours. And that's the phrase, live and let live. People say all the time, it's this idea that all should be able to live their lives in the manner they want to, regardless of what others may think of them. And this is a common belief in our culture today. But if we go back during the time when Jesus lived on the earth, what do you think the biggest cultural value was in that day? I would make a very strong argument that the biggest cultural value during the time of the life of Jesus was justice. An eye for an eye. A tooth for a tooth. You do something wrong, you deserve to be penalized. You steal, your hand gets cut off. If I ask the same question today to people that are living in our world, to my friends, what is the biggest cultural value of our world today? You could make an argument that the biggest cultural value might be tolerance or live and let live. Tolerance, it used to mean that all people have equal value. In other words, we're going to value people. But today, though, tolerance has evolved to mean that all ideas and all behavior have equal value. 
Even the definition of tolerance has changed, so much so that it's wrong and unacceptable to ever say that behavior is wrong or even sinful. Dare we say the word sinful? We've even watered down and sanitized what is considered to be sinful terms and given more easily acceptable phrases to help us feel better. For example, no one likes to talk about this word sin, but if I just took the category of sexual sin and you look at what we call things today, instead of saying you're looking at pornography, instead we say it's adult entertainment. It just It's more acceptable. It makes us feel better about what we're doing. We're not going to say somebody committed adultery. That's too harsh. Instead, we'll say they had an affair and it doesn't sound nearly as bad. We're not going to call premarital sex is sin in our culture today. Instead, we're going to say we're just living together or sleeping together. We've taken what once was wrong and have even changed the way that we describe it because in our culture today, the unpardonable sin is, hey, don't ever tell somebody that's wrong. And besides, it's none of your business. What I'm doing, I can do whatever I want as long as it, I don't hurt anyone. It doesn't matter how you live as long as you don't hurt anyone. And that's what we're going to fact check today. The Bible says this in 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 3. For a time is coming when people will no longer listen to sound and wholesome teaching. They will follow their own desires and will look for teachers who will tell them whatever their itching ears want to hear. So here's the fact check. Sin is very real and sin has dramatic earthly consequences and potentially eternal consequences as well. So let's talk about the three cultural misbeliefs about sin and let's look at what God really does say about how you live your life on this earth. There are three fact checks about sin I want to take you on. And number one is this. Fact check number one. I'm not a bad person. This is a common belief that I'm not a bad person. I mean, we all make some mistakes, but I'm not a bad person. I'm a good person. And the reality is this is simply not true. I'm a bad person and you're a bad person. In fact, in John, in, in the book of John, it says this in 1 John chapter 1, verse 8. If we claim to be without sin... We deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. We've used this illustration often in our church, and if you're tired of it, I'm sorry. But if I ask you how many of you have ever told a lie, hopefully everyone would raise a hand in this place. And if you don't, liar, liar, pants on fire. If I ask you how many of you have ever stolen something, how many of you ever look lustfully at somebody? I mean, you were a little slower to raise your hand on that one, especially if you're sitting next to your spouse. But let's just go ahead and unpack this a bit. If you've told a lie, what are you? You're a liar. If you've stolen something, what are you? A thief. If you look lustfully at someone, Jesus said you've actually already committed adultery in your heart. So let's say if you look lustfully at someone, what are you? You're an adulterer. So what are you? You're a lying, thieving adulterer. Welcome to Family Church where we we'll make you feel better about yourself. Okay, so we're not good people. We know this now. We are sinful at our core. In fact, Scripture teaches us this in Romans chapter 3, verse 10. There is no one righteous, not even one. You're not, I'm not, not even Mother Teresa would qualify. There's no one righteous, not even one. To say I'm not a bad person is simply not true because we are all sinful in the eyes of God. The second cultural misbelief about sin is this. All sin is the same. So fact check number two. All sin is the same. Many people believe this, that it's all the same. We say things like, who are you to judge me? What I'm doing is no worse than what you're doing. All sin's the same anyway. But God never said that. The Bible doesn't teach that all sin is the same. What the Bible teaches is that all unforgiven sin leads to eternal death. But not all sin is the same. The Apostle Paul said this in Romans chapter 6, verse 23 in the Bible. He said, for the wages of sin is death. That's what it costs, death. But the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. For the price of sin is what? It's death. Little sin, big sin, whatever kind of sin, any type of unforgiven sin leads to death. Well then, who forgives sin? Only Jesus Christ claimed to have the power to forgive sins. This is why he was hated by the religious leaders. This is why Jesus had to die on the cross because he was the only one righteous enough. He was without sin to take on the sin of the world. And this is the good news to us that the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ. So if you lie about something, that's a sin. 
if you murder someone, it's also a sin, but it's a different type of sin with different earthly consequences. Both will keep you out of heaven if you haven't asked Jesus for forgiveness because it's forgiven people that go to heaven, not good people. Both of those sins are not equal in terms of consequences. All sin is not the same. All unforgiven sin will separate you from God, but all sin is not the same. So how we live actually does matter. In fact, it influences at least three things. How we live our life on earth influences consequences on earth. So if you're a blessing to other people, they are more likely to be a blessing to you. It's you reap what you sow. If you commit a sin, there are, there are consequences on earth, but all the consequences are not the same. For example, if our youth pastors who are sitting over here to my left commit the sin of a gluttony, they'll probably still be able to be a youth pastor. But if Cody is selling drugs to students, you can't be the youth pastor anymore. So Cody, I'm sorry. There are different earthly consequences to our behavior. How we live influences consequences on earth and also the, the rewards we receive in heaven. We know that we can't earn God's love or his grace based upon the work we do for him. That's not Christianity. Christianity is not a works-based religion. Jesus came for a relationship with you and I. But there are rewards waiting for the Christian who does the work of the Lord on earth. And we have to recognize that God rewards certain godly behaviors in heaven. And there are rewards in heaven for how we lived on earth and what we do or don't do on earth. There are different crowns the Bible refers to in the scriptures. You can read about it. It's almost like there's going to be a trophy ceremony, a reward ceremony when we get to heaven for our faithfulness and how we live for him on earth. And I can't wait for that reward ceremony in heaven one day. It's going to be awesome. So the way that we live matters. It even influences punishment in hell. And again, another word no one likes to talk about. I, my, even myself as a preacher, I don't like to mention the word hell, but I have to. The scriptures heavily imply that how we live influences punishment in hell. Obviously, we don't know the details, but it influences this in a big way. Let me show you a couple of different verses in the Bible. Luke's uh, Gospel, chapter 20, verse 47 says, The Pharisees devour widows' houses for a show, make lengthy prayers. These men will be punished most severely, the Bible says. So God evidently hates that type of hip hypocrisy. In other words, this implies there might be a less severe punishment for some people in actions, and there might be a more severe punishment for others. Jesus said to Pontius Pilate in John chapter 19, 11, he said, Therefore, the one who handed me over to you is guilty of a greater sin. He's implying that there's a lesser sin and there's a greater sin. For example, when you look at the category of sexual sin, the Apostle Paul pulls us off to the side and Here's what he says about sexual sin in 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 18. He says, run from sexual sin. No other sin so clearly affects the body as this one does, for sexual immorality is a sin against your own body. In other words, there is different consequences to the sin than there would be to other ones. He says, for sexual immorality is a sin against your own body. Don't you know that your body was purchased by the shed blood of Jesus? So flee from sexual sin, the Apostle Paul says. All other sin, he says, fight it, resist it, but not this one. Don't even fight it. He says, run, Forrest, run, <laughs> because this one impacts you in a very deep, personal, and significant way. So people will say, it doesn't matter how you live as long as you don't hurt anyone. Well, God never said that. How we live, what we do, it matters on this earth. And in fact, it matters in eternity as well. So fact check number one. I'm not a bad person. Yes, you are. I'm a bad person. You're a bad person. We're sinful in the eyes of a holy God. Fact check number two. Well, all sin is the same. Well, no, actually it's not. All unforgiven sin separates us from God and has eternal consequences. But there are certain sins on earth that will have more consequences on our lives while we're living on earth. And thirdly, fact check number three. The third big cultural lie that so many people believe today is well, since I've already done it, I might as well keep doing it. Well, I'm not a virgin anymore, so it doesn't matter anymore. I cheated and I didn't get caught. It didn't hurt anyone, so I might as well do it again. I already looked at something I probably shouldn't have looked at, but I managed to erase my track, so I might as well do it again. I've already done it once. It's not hurting anyone, so I might as well do it again. And evidently, a couple of thousand of years ago, 
That problem was just as real as it is today because the Apostle Paul asked this question in the book of Romans chapter 6 verse 1. He said this, Should we keep on sinning so that God can show us more and more of his wonderful grace? Of course not. Since we have died to sin, how can we continue to live in it? If God is going to forgive us anyway, why should I even stop, is what some people will believe. Christians, why? What? he's going to forgive you anyway. Why should I change? Why does it matter how I live my life? And the answer to that question is because God has something so much better for you. And I'm telling you, don't trade in the blessings of God for a cheap, temporary thrill. Sin is progressive. It'll take you further than you want to go, and it'll always cost you more than you want to pay. But here's the good news. I'm so thankful that Jesus is a friend of sinners. Oh, what a sigh of relief. This message was so heavy until this point. Jesus is a friend of sinners. The Bible says in 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 13, And God is faithful. He will not let you be tempted beyond what you can bear. But when you are tempted, he will also provide a way out so that you can endure it. And so I'll close with this. Have you ever seen all those silly warnings they print on practically everything these days? The stickers that are on hair dryers that say, warning, don't take a bath and dry your hair at the same time you could be electrocuted. You know that was only put on there because someone tried it. Or the warning on electrical sockets that read, caution, do not stick your tongue into this socket or you will be electrocuted. You know someone tried it. They actually tried it. So they had to put the sticker on the thing. Or the warning that appears on the back of those windshield covers, the kind that block the sun from heating up your car. There's an actual warning that says, caution, do not attempt to drive with this cover in place. Because you know someone actually tried it and they were successful. Some of the most tragic and completely avoidable accidents occur every single day because of warnings that were ignored. And the same is true when it comes to spiritual things and how you live your life for God. There are warning signs posted. You can choose to ignore the warning signs or you can heed them. You might think that it is easy for a person to go to hell. But I'm here today to tell you it is not easy for a person to go to hell. In fact, it is literally hard. And there are warning signs from God each step of the way that you will have to ignore if you choose to go to this place in eternity called hell. For in the Bible it says, The Lord isn't really being slow about his promise, as some people think. No, he is being patient for your sake. He does not want anyone to be destroyed or go to hell, but wants everyone to repent. That's what 2 Peter 3, verse 9 says. As a matter of fact, God is actually placing obstacles in our way. Caution tape that we have to literally go over or under or through if we choose to go to hell. In the Bible, Jesus said there are two roads. You can read about it. Jesus describes these two roads that we can travel. One of them is narrow. But it's not so narrow that it cannot be found because it is marked well. It's marked by the blood-splattered footprints of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, who walked this road many, many years ago. And it's marked well with the Bible, which is the Word of God. And it's marked well by the disciples and the followers of Christ that have gone before us that guide us on this narrow road. But then there's another road, it's the second road, and this road is broad, it's wide, it's easy to locate. And a lot of people walk this road, it's paved with the pleasures of this world, the temporary cheap thrills of life that lead to more emptiness. And there's many that travel this road, but the Bible says this freeway, this fast track, leads to eternal damnation. It leads to death in a place called hell. That wasn't created for people, but for Satan and his demons. And that's the road that a lot of people are choosing to travel. But if you would go with me down this road with the last couple minutes that I have, I just want to travel down this broad road for a moment. If you'll just take a minute, let's look and see what God has placed in our way to detour us, to warn us, to block us from going down this broad road. The first roadblock on the way to hell is the church. Everyone in the United States of America is in reach of a full gospel church. There's practically one on every corner. Thousands of good churches everywhere. I know churches are not perfect, but God has placed hundreds of churches where you could hear the gospel of Jesus Christ, of salvation and repentance and reconciliation. And so if you go to hell, you'll have to ignore his church and view it as non-essential. And on we travel on the second roadblock on the way to hell, and you'll find this second roadblock, the sermon. 
Every time the gospel is preached, it's a roadblock on the road to hell. The sermons of the great evangelists of the past, every sermon preached in every church, every sermon preached on the radio, every sermon preached in this book by men like Peter and James and John, every, every sermon preached by so, someone's life, every personal witness is a blockade to you on your road to hell. And if you reject this sermon, if you reject the message of Jesus Christ, you literally have to go over this simple message that any child could understand, that God loves you. And he sent his one and only son, Jesus Christ, to die on the cross for the sins of the world, that he rose to life again and he wants to live in you and change you from the inside out. On the road to hell, you would have to ignore every sermon you've ever heard. And if we travel down this road on the way to hell, you would have to ignore the word of God. If Jesus Christ came back to this city today, you know what book he would preach out of? This, he would preach out of this book that I hold in my hand right here. You cannot improve upon this book. This book has passed the test of time, the Word of God. It is the Word of our living God. And the Bible said, Heaven and earth will pass away, but the Word of the Lord will never pass away. This book that I hold in my hand is your blueprint. It is your map. It is your way to salvation. But someday this book I hold in my hand will be your judge. And if a man or woman goes to hell, he or she will have to ignore the church. Every sermon they've ever heard preached and the word of God, because the road to hell is difficult to get to, because on the road to hell, you'll suddenly find another roadblock, another warning. It's called your conscience. The Bible says that God has planted eternity in the human heart, meaning deep down, there is this innate sense inside of every man, woman, boy, and girl that says there's got to be more to life than this earth. There must be a creator. There must be a God. And your conscience tells you what is right and wrong. And so on the road to hell, you'll have to ignore your conscience, that deep sense that we were made for more. And if we continue down this road, it'll lead you to yet another block in the road. Prayer. The prayers of those who love you. Every prayer that's gone up for you. There have been prayers that have been prayed for this service today, this message, this message that you're hearing. All the people that have interceded on your behalf. I want to tell you today that if you hear this message and you decide to continue without God, you will have to go through the prayer of people that love you, the prayers of mothers praying for prodigal sons and daughters, the prayer of a father, the prayer of a friend, and suddenly another blockade is in the way, and it's called the sorrows of life. You know, Did you know that God is a God of love and a God of amazing mercy, mercy that's new every morning? He always speaks in mercy before he speaks in judgment. But the Bible says, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son. Meaning God has done everything in his power to get the attention of those that are on this road. But he loves you so much that if you will not listen to his mercy, he will chase you down using the sorrows of life to get your attention, to bring you to your knees and to turn towards him. And if your heart starts to harden as you head down this road to hell, we come to the next hurdle. It's one of the most dangerous of them all because there is one sin in the Bible that says there is no forgiveness for. It's called the sin against the Holy Spirit. It's the unpardonable sin. The Bible says no one can be saved unless the Spirit draws him. When you sin against the Holy Spirit, that means that you just won't come to him. You just don't care. You reject the Holy Spirit. You reject the message. And if you go to hell, you'll have to reject Jesus Christ and you'll have to ignore the gentle whisper of the Holy Spirit. And lastly, the last hurdle on the road to hell, it's difficult to get there. It's as high as a mountain. In fact, it is a mountain. It's called Calvary. As we look upon Calvary, we see the old rugged cross and we see the, sons, the Son of God. We see the nail prints in his hands. And we see the crown upon his brow. You have to literally step over Calvary. You have to ignore Jesus who took the cross and paid the penalty of sin for anyone that would acknowledge him. So if there really is a hell, if God doesn't lie, if there really is a hell and it's not God's will that any should go there, he's literally done everything that he can to put roadblocks in your way and in my way. He's spoken to you through the church. He's spoken to you through sermons and through his holy word and through the conscience, through the sorrows of life and through the drawings of his Holy Spirit and through Calvary's cross and on and on. God has put all these roadblocks in your way because he loves you. He's done everything that he can to keep you from there. There's no one who loves you more than the Lord. And so this message I'm preaching today, 
is a message of love. To challenge this belief that says it doesn't matter how you live as long as you don't hurt anyone, this is simply not true. It's a lie from the pit of hell. In fact, it matters very much how you live on this earth because you'll be in eternity a whole lot longer than you live on this earth. But our God is faithful, the Bible says, and he will not let you be tempted beyond what you can bear. He will always give you a way out. And so I'm challenging Christians to honor God with your life. And I'm challenging those who have not yet received this grace that is so freely given to us to receive Jesus Christ is your personal Lord and Savior, and that's how we're going to close. I just want to invite you to pray with me. With every head bowed and every eye closed, or maybe you're at home watching this, God, I pray that by your power, by your Holy Spirit, you will speak to your church. And I thank you in advance that there are those who maybe for months or years have been trapped. That God, I thank you, you're faithful, and you always give a way out. Heavenly Father, I thank you in advance for those who are just even getting closer to Jesus, and you're revealing the impurities in our lives, and by your power, you're conforming us to the image of your Son. If the Holy Spirit is speaking to you right now, maybe showing you some area of your life that you want to confess before God and find a way out that you could better glorify Him, not to win His love, but just out of reflection of His love. Lord, forgive us. Make us more sensitive to the things in our lives that don't please you. The closer you get to Jesus, the more you recognize your sinfulness. And so, this is not a sign of weakness. This is a sign of strength. There is something in our life displeasing to God. I, I want his forgiveness, and I want his help to overcome it. I want to find a way out through Jesus. God, I pray that through your Holy Spirit, you will set people free. God, I thank you that your love is not based on our performance, but your love is based on your goodness. You love us no matter what. That, God, you love us so much that you don't want us to be trapped, and that, which, that breaks your heart when you see us in bondage. So God, I ask in the name of Jesus that the power of sin will be broken, that we will not continue in it because he who the Son has set free is free indeed. And God, we thank you because of the death, the resurrection of your Son, Jesus, we are free. The power of sin does not hold us back, but the power of the Spirit leads us to life and righteousness. And as we keep praying today, there are those of you who recognize you have a need for a Savior. And all I can tell you is there, is, there was a time in my life when the reality hit me that I am not a good person. And until you see yourself as a sinner, you won't know that you have a need for a Savior. And there are those of you who are going to recognize right now you need forgiveness. You can't earn it and you don't deserve it. None of us do. That's why the gospel is good news because God came to us through Jesus, a friend of sinners. He became sin for us on the cross, died, and on the third day he rose again so that anyone who calls on his name would be saved. And quite honestly, that's why many of you are here today. You recognize it's not about religion, it's not about works, it's all about his love and his grace, and you want it and you need it. What do you do? You turn from your sins and you say, Jesus, I trust you. Today, by faith, I surrender my life to you. I recognize I need a Savior, and Jesus, I ask you to forgive and save me and make me new. And when you call out to him, all of your sins will be forgiven, and you'll be brand new. And if that's you today, just pray, Heavenly Father, I recognize I'm a sinner and I need a Savior. Jesus, forgive me. Make me brand new. Fill me with your spirit so I can know you, so I can serve you, so I can follow you all the days of my life. I confess my life is not my own. Today I give it to you. You have mine from this day forward. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Thank you for watching wherever you're watching this from. God bless you. Have a great rest of your day. And uh, please let us know if you prayed that prayer. We would love to help you in your next steps in following Christ. Who am I that the highest king would welcome me? I was lost, but he brought me and knew his love for me. Yeah, his love for me. He has ransomed me, His grace will
building message. We hope you were encouraged. And if you just made that decision to follow Jesus, congratulations. This is the most important decision of your life and all of heaven is throwing a party and so are we. Let us know about your decision by clicking the button in the chat or if you're watching on demand, just click on the link that pops up in your screen. Our team would love to connect with you and give you your next step. Thank you for watching Family Church Online. If you tuned in a little later and you'd like to partner with us in making a difference as we continue food distribution to those in need and all of our other online community efforts, just text FC Whittier or FC Signal Hill to 28950 and follow the prompts or go to familychurch.co and click on the Give tab for other ways to give. If you've never been to a family church location in person, we would love to have you come through to one of our services. You can find service times and locations at familychurch.co. We love you church, stay connected, and see you soon.